Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, so for the next 30 minutes, we're going to talk about Kubernetes policy management. Uh, so really excited to cover, uh, you know, and we have quite a lot of topics prepared. So we're going to start with some quick introductions, talk about why you need policies in Kubernetes, what Kubernetes policies are, what types of policies are supported. Then we're going to go into some details about you know, specific policy implementations, including pod security ad uh, admissions, um, yeah, or uh, for also like talk a little bit about PSPs, why they were deprecated, and then go into validating admission policies, which is a new type in Kubernetes, compare that with what dynamic admission controllers can do, uh, and also introduce Cell, which is the language used by validating admission policies. So quite a lot of topics to cover, and we'll go through these. And of course, we'll try and save some time for questions and answers. So happy to have the conversation. Um, so to start off with, just some quick introductions on who we are and why we care about this uh, subject. So I'm Jim Beguadia, co-founder CEO at Nirmata. I'm a co-chair in the policy working group within CNCF, also a maintainer on the Kiverno project, which is a CNCF policy engine. And I'm Andy. I'm the CTO at Fairwinds. Uh, I've been working in the cloud native space for about eight to ten years at this point. I'm a maintainer of several open source projects that you may be familiar with, Goldilocks, Pluto, Polaris, and uh, also a co-chair of the policy working group as of late last year. All right, so just to kick things off, introducing what we do in the policy working group, and this is a community forum. Everybody's welcome to join. We have biweekly meetings. So the charter of the working group is to define or at least catalog architectures, different policy implementation types, and, and provide some guidance on what users should use, right? So we've done things like the policy reporting API is one of the initiatives that came out of the policy working group. There's a number of different producers and consumers, including Kiverno, Falco, Trivi, all of them can report policy results in a common structured manner. And we're looking at other initiatives as we move forward, including like, you know, of course, uh, white papers, uh, and things like we can do to help uh, again, educate or inform the community. Um, so starting with what is a policy, right? So there's a definition and one of the things we contributed from the working group, there's a chapter on policies in the Kubernetes docs. So here, very, quite simply, you know, what we think of as policies are configurations that manage other configurations or behaviors, right? And if you think about that, a policy is nothing more than just another config object, a resource. It could be a custom resource, could be a built-in resource, or some type of control you're providing, which is defining behaviors for other things in your cluster or in what you're managing, right? There's a more formal NIST definition too, but it's very similar. It's talking about, you know, making sure you're managing expected behaviors. And, you know, what we think about over here is it's not just about restricting or validating checks, but you can also generate, mutate, it's full configuration lifecycle management, right? Um, so but why do we need policies? We have config objects, you can configure them, you can manage them. What's the value policies bring in? So the one thing to always think about with Kubernetes, uh, in many ways, Kubernetes is the first platform which really is built for developers, operators, security to all collaborate, right? It's a set of standard APIs where all of these roles can interact. And the idea behind policies is if you have these shared resources, who's managing it? So if you have a pod or a deployment, there's parts of the deployment that security might care about. There's parts of the deployment the application developer cares about, and there's other parts that the operator cares about. So how do you bring all of these together and have them collaborate on the same artifact or on the same resource? And that's where policies can add a lot of value by providing that way to collaborate across those. And with Kubernetes, you know, it's not designed to be secure by default. You need to add some tooling, some other ways to secure it. 
policies become in an ideal way for these various constraints to be applied, security teams to get the compliance and results they need, whereas operations and development teams to be able to do their work without stepping on each other's toes, right? So that's the main value. And of course, if you extend that to policy as code, why not use the same GitOps and the other best practices we love in cloud native, apply that to policies as well, right? Now you can do full lifecycle management, manage your policies across clusters, get you know reports, things like that, and even manage exceptions with using the same Kubernetes APIs. So in Kubernetes, there's four policy types, right? And this is, uh, even as we were going through this and we added this to the Kubernetes docs, took a while to classify. There's four main, there's several other ways of configuring policies, but there's built-in objects like obviously network policy, right? So the name itself says policy. So it defines what you can do on the networking side. Uh, so it matches that description or definition we talked about. Uh, so those are built-in objects, and there's RBAC and several others which would qualify as policy objects. Then you have admission controls, and these are flags or these are configurations on the API server which you can enable, disable. Sometimes there's additional settings for these, but things like you know if you want to have your default ingress class, you can actually specify this on the API server and say, here's my default ingress. That will apply to all your cluster, manage that configuration for you. That is not, you know, it's different than dynamic admission controls, which is the next category, where you have tools like, you know, Kiverno or OPA Gatekeeper, which are not built into the API server, but they can receive requests from the API server and apply policies, right? And finally, now we have validating admission policies, which is currently beta, moving to graduation. Uh, and that is also a built-in type, so that allows you to now configure the API server with some customizable policy checks, and we'll talk about that too. Uh, so next, Andy's gonna go over a timeline of how all of this happened. Yeah, and uh, before you all start squinting and trying to read that, uh, we're gonna break it down here in a second, but we uh, set out to write this talk and we uh, thought, started talking about like all the different historical pieces of policy uh, throughout the timeline of Kubernetes, and even you know us in the policy working group were like, oh, when did that happen, and when did that happen? So we decided to put together this timeline to show where we started and how far we've come, and maybe talk a little bit about what's coming next. So if we go all the way back, Kubernetes 1.3, I think this might have been before I even started working on Kubernetes, we had security context constraints. These are a thing in OpenShift. I actually didn't know what they were until about two weeks ago, so we're gonna skip right over that. <laughs> and then we get into uh, Kubernetes 1.3 and beyond in 2016 to 2018, and a few things start happening. So we get our first policy engine accepted into the CNCF, so this is when OPA went into the sandbox uh, category. And then uh, PSP was introduced and became kind of the standard for a long time, and we'll see that uh, throughout the rest of this timeline. And uh, that gave us granular control over lots of different settings in the pod, and we were able to control it via RBAC, and it was rather powerful, but it was kind of difficult to use. So we step forward into the future. 1.4 to 1.20, PSP was refined, maligned, hated, people talked poorly about it, people didn't use it, people didn't adopt it. Uh, and so there was a cap introduced to uh, talk about pod security admission and um, you know get us into the future. And so that started becoming the thing that people wanted to talk about. And OPA moved into the incubating status, so it started becoming much more popular. And Caverno entered the scene uh, into the CNCF and um, was uh, released, its GA release uh, came about. And then um, we got the policy report CRD from the policy working group in, what is that, 2021, it's about. So um, that was kind of the formative time for what we see now as the current state of policy. So then we step into the last few years and a lot of different stuff happened across all of these different projects. So PSP was officially deprecated and removed from the API 
Um, and then pod security admission moved into stable. And then we started seeing validating admission policy. So validating admission policy using the cell expression language is now in beta in the current versions of 1.20, uh, 1.28 and on. And then uh, Caverno just applied for graduation just last year. And so it's becoming much more stable. And OPA also graduated during this time. So we're starting to see all of these different engines mature and the in-tree uh, policy engines mature as well. Now, what's going to happen this year and moving forward? Ideally, Caverno will graduate. Uh, at some point, we're not entirely certain when, valid validating admission policy will move to stable. And we'll also see uh, an extension to validating admission policy, which will be mutating admission policy, which will allow us to mutate objects rather than just reject them. And the policy working group is hoping to finish moving the policy report API definition into a more stable state, a more permanent home underneath SIGAuth. So next, let's talk a little bit about why PSPs got deprecated and you know what some of the challenges there were, right? And there's a great um, you know white paper uh, article blog written by Tabitha, who leads Sig Security in Kubernetes. Um, where you know they mention a lot of the usability challenges, a lot of problems, and there were prior you know uh, KubeCon talks on this too. And the main challenge was, uh, like Andy also mentioned, that although everybody understood why PSPs are important, it was just hard to configure and use correctly, especially at scale, right? And there were just too many variations, too many ways to trip yourself and misconfigure things which is sort of the opposite of why you want a policy, right? You want policies to help with configuration, not create more problems in your cluster, right? And diagnosing troubleshooting was also a major problem with this, right? So with the deprecation, as this was being discussed in SIGAUTH, SIG Security, a lot of people felt that, yes, we need some, something basic in Kubernetes, but it's also time to acknowledge there's other powerful policy engines, there's other solutions, so let them do some of the more complex things that are required. And you know, instead of just sort of having these configuration objects, let's think of this almost like a compliance standard, right? So if you look at PCI DSS or HIPAA or you know, any compliance standard, it's a document, it's well-defined. You can go and see exactly what you, know, you need to do. So one thing which is great, which emerged out of this, all these discussions is pod security standards. This is part of the Kubernetes docs itself. It's maintained by the Kubernetes maintainers for every release of Kubernetes. And it defines about 17 controls for pod security. And, and all of this, everything we're talking about here is for the security context within pods, right? So within pods, as well as containers inside of pods, you can configure security context with various settings. So these controls go into a lot of detail about what should be, you know, what's safe to configure, how you should configure them, what the allowed values are, and they evolve. With new versions of Kubernetes, you will see changes in this, right? So it's not static, it's not a one-time thing. As Kubernetes evolves, these standards also evolve. Uh, so once you have these standards, you can have multiple implementations, and the entry implementation of this is pod security admission. And pod security admission, the idea was, let's provide, again, something basic, which you know, can be easily enabled, which may not cover all the use cases, but at least it lets you to get to a secure default. And the idea here was to you know, have a three levels of privilege, which of course allows everything, but then you have a baseline, which any known vulnerability, any known issue or misconfiguration is covered by baseline. And then restricted, which is the you know, recommended way of running highly secure clusters um, to go into the restricted level of policy. And, and this allows you to set it very easily just using labels at a namespace level. So that, you know, again, is super easy to configure, but has some limitations. And in the real world, what we've seen is it often doesn't get used because it's only at the namespace level. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Next, Andy's going to go into validating admission policies in cell. So we removed pod security policy. And then we created pod security admission. And 
like Jim was saying, it's not highly config. Pod security admission is not configurable. It's not even highly configurable. It's just not configurable. And so we were relying on dynamic admission controllers to do all of our policy. And then some folks brought up the need to uh, write policy at admission time. And some people wanted to do it in tree. So what we got out of that was this, uh, validating admission policy. So validating admission policy uses cell. We've mentioned it a couple times. That's a common expression language. It's a relatively straightforward language for defining policy. Uh, it requires bindings to bind the policy to a specific object or set of objects. You can declare as a separate CRD uh, parameters that are used by that policy. So it is configurable per namespace or per binding to allow you to modify how the policy behaves. And as we mentioned before, it's currently in beta. Keep forgetting I have a clicker. All right, so um, if we look at cell, how these policies are defined, it is fairly developer friendly. It's sort of small. We'll get into that in a second. Um, it's very extensible, so there's quite a few different macros that are in the current implementation of validating admission policy that allow you to do fancy things like regex matching, um, optional types, you can compare different types of ints together, uh, and one of the interesting ones that I learned about recently is the authorizer, so you can actually check groups and users of the, the whoever's performing that admission action. Um, but really the issue with cell that we see is that it gets rather verbose. This right here is just one check to say, don't let the container run its route. And the reason that it gets so verbose is because I have to check every single container. I have to check and make sure that um, the run as root, the, um, run as root section exists. And then I also have to check the init containers separately. So we end up with this very verbose policy for what is a relatively simple and straightforward check in Kubernetes. So we could split this into multiple uh, policies, but then we're running multiple checks against every object every time we do that. And also here, we don't get great uh, error messages because right now it's like, well, one container in this pod somewhere is running as root, but we don't know which one because we just had to run 12 checks as part of this single check. So this is cell. It's relatively straightforward to use for simple things. It gets you a lot further than pod security admission, um, but I think there's more improvement to be had here. Um, and then the next thing coming up on top of that is mutating emission policy. So there's a cap out there for this. This is just kind of a, a side note here. Uh, currently in, it's not even in alpha yet, right? Yeah, so it's uh, coming hopefully in alpha in I think 1.31, possibly 1.32. So just keep an eye out for that. So we put together this table to compare all of the different policy options and talk about you know, what they're good at, what they're not good at. We've talked about this a little bit already, but it's nice to see it all in one big table. And so we've got you know, the first column there with pod security admission. We've got validating admission policy, which gets you a little bit further. Um, it gives you more granular control. It's still built in just like PSA is. Um, and then you know, we've got a weird little symbol there for exception management to denote that since validating admission policy is opt-in, not opt-out, exception management is a little bit odd. So you know, if we say this applies to every object in the cluster, there's no way to opt a single workload out of it. But you could write in a cell expression to you know, exempt various workloads or pods or containers from your policy. Uh, but then you're modifying your policy every time you need an exemption, which we've found across the various people that we talk to is not the ideal way you want to sort of have one solid policy that works all the time and then make your exceptions somewhere else. Um, and then um, none of the built-in controllers support the policy report API, which the working group has published. Um, and neither of them work in, in the CLI. Um, and so. Really, what we end up at is dynamic admission controllers still as kind of the de facto way to do all these things if you want to do them all. I think Jim wants to talk a little bit more about some of the, the other bits. Yeah, so one question that comes up often, and you know, like Andy was describing, is so you can do checks and sell, but validating admission policies do have some limitations to what they can check, right? So what exactly 
can you do and can you not do, and when do you need dynamic admission controllers? So, you know, the, the usual answer as well for more complex policies use um, uh, something like OPA Gatekeeper or Kiverno or other tools. Um, but if you kind of dig in a little bit into more detail, really the way to think about it is any policy that operates on a single object, which is the thing that's being changed at admission controls, you can write a cell expression to do that. There's also built in, you know, like Andrew was saying with the authorizer, if you want to do um, like a self check review for, you know, access control, you can do things like that because the Kubernetes authors have put in extensions into cell to allow that, right? But you can't look up some other API object as part of your policy. Classic example, if you want to limit every namespace to a single load balancer, you know, OPA or, you know, with Rego or Kiverno can do that fairly easily. With something like cell and validating admission policies, you can't do that lookup. So that's one thing to think about. Anything that, you know, expands beyond the scope of that single admission control it's not possible to do in the, you know, with validating admission policy. Other things like if you want to do image verification, right? You want to check signatures, uh, you want to do that. You can't, you know, now call an external registry to fetch the signature artifact and to compare that. You, it's not something validating admission policy will support. It's not something you can want to do in the API server because of the latency and other things that it introduces, right? Um, also, like of course, with policy, going back to the definition we started with, if policies are configurations to manage other configurations, the keyword there being managed, you want to think about the full life cycle of configurations, right? So you want to be able to mutate, which will, you know, again, simple mutations will be allowed in the API server. And, but you want to do even complex mutations on existing resources, right? So let's say some API gets deprecated, you want to write a mutate policy and you want to update it to a new group, a new type, why not write a policy for that? It's a great way of you know, handling that. Um, things also like you might want to generate resources. When a new namespace is created, generate secure defaults, generate fine-grained roles and role bindings, generate network policies. So all of those things, when you think about managing configuration, are within the scope of policy management, which you know will not, of course, be handled within validating admission policy or the upcoming mutating admission policy. You'll need external tools for that, right? So that's, those are some of the trade-offs to think about as you're comparing these tools. So ultimately, you know, one of the things to think about is, so you can use validating admission policies, and you should, whenever possible, but you'll still need dynamic admission controllers. So what is the best you know, way to manage these? And the good news here is both Kiverno as well as OPA, Gatekeeper, both CNCF projects, they're fully embracing and supporting validating admission policies. So with the latest releases of these, you know, uh, these policy engines, they will generate and manage the lifecycle of validating admission policies for you. So you don't need to necessarily think about which one to choose and when to do what. If you're using you know, Gatekeeper and you use their way of you know, declaring policies, wherever possible, they will execute that policy in the API server. Same thing with Kiverno. If you write Kiverno with Cell, it will automatically generate and manage the lifecycle of validating admission policies as well as bindings automatically for you so that these policies can execute in the API server rather than receiving the webhook, which you know, is the normal way of processing policies in Kiverno, right? So it gives a lot of power in terms of how you can kind of balance between those two. Yeah, so just you know, on that, and there's a lot of discussion on so what are the challenges uh, or why run something in the API server if I'm still going to use, you know, a dynamic admission controller, right? So why not just put everything there? The problem with dynamic admission controllers is so a few things. Like, first off, once dynamic admission controls uh, came about, it's like, you know, they say if you have a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail. Every problem in Kubernetes was solved by another dynamic admission controller. Obviously not a good scenario where you have, if you have a half a dozen 
dynamic admission controllers running in your cluster, all trying to mutate or validate things, you are going to run into issues. So don't do that, right? Just pick one or two, try to keep it as minimum as possible. But as you're running dynamic admission controllers, these are highly mission critical workloads. These are things which have to be managed carefully. If you just take the default Helm chart from any of these projects and slap it into your cluster and expect it to work in production, that's not gonna happen, right? You need to tune this. You need to understand what is happening in these controllers. They receive, like you know, in the very early days of even Kiverno, naively it was receiving every request from the API server. And of course, you know, keeping up with that, it will you know, slow down your API requests, it will impact other workloads. So there's a lot of tuning that can be done with these projects. And the way to think about it is it has to be a highly available, highly secure, low latency type of workload. And you want to minimize what goes to these dynamic admission controllers uh, and do as much as possible in the API server itself, right? So, and that's what both of these projects now are moving towards is very fine-grained configuration of the webhook configuration objects, which is where you can define which requests go to the, you know, the dynamic admission controller, like the Kiverno workload or the gatekeeper workload, and which requests should be handled directly in the API server. And you can tune that in many ways. There's also defaults of excluding certain namespaces. One common problem like with Coop system or your CNI namespace, if you have, let, let's say for example, Kiverno now policing your you know, Coop system namespace or your CNI namespace, and if you're trying to do a CNI upgrade, that might get blocked. Now that will of course impact your cluster. So to avoid things like that, you wanna make sure you've configured it correctly based on your set of add-ons, based on how you're managing Kiverno. Uh, and you continue to monitor that, right? So there's a lot of metrics, even traceability in these projects, which show you exactly what requests are being handled, how much latency it takes for each. So keeping these within milliseconds, anything that goes over 10 milliseconds is a problem. Webhooks can also, they have this failure mode called fail open and fail closed. And basically what that means is how do you handle a failure? Fail open means, well, even if there's a failure, something unknown happens, continue with the operation. But the problem is you have to wait for 10 seconds for that failure to happen. So let's say all your you know, admission controller pods are down and you have to wait 10 seconds for each API request, which should go there. Of course, it's gonna slow down other things, right? So these are things to be aware of and just use best practices, much like you would with a database or with other mission critical workloads, you're gonna apply best practices for monitoring, managing that workload, apply the same for your dynamic admission controllers and try and keep them to a minimum in the sense, again, if you have too many of these, it starts creating problems in your clusters. Yeah, so just, uh, you know, in terms of guidance and some of this we covered already, so wherever possible, use what's built in, right? So start with that as validating admission policies are going to GA. If you haven't kind of started, you know, experimenting with them, start using them, try out what can be done. Uh, you can, like in, with, in the Kiverno project, there's also a library of policies for everything for pod security. Uh, you, now there's a cell version of those as well so they can be executed directly in the API server. So take a look at that or just take a look at other examples for what needs to be done. And, and then for, you know, as you kind of pick and choose different policy engines, figure out what applies best to your workloads, to your use case, but try and prefer tooling which automatically uses and leverages these tools, right? So again, there are other tools which may not know how to deal with a validating admission policy. So then you're missing out on certain features coming in Kubernetes because all of this has to be now offloaded into some other check or some other configuration tool, right? And for, uh, you know, thinking about like other uh, stuff like applying things in pipelines. So as much as you can, if you're following GitOps, and if you're not, you should be looking at seeing how you can leverage GitOps. If you can apply these checks directly in your CI, CD pipeline, but then apply the same policy as well at admission controls and periodically as background checks, now you have defense in depth at every layer, right? So 
but at the earlier you can apply this, the better. So definitely executing some of these um, you know, in your pipeline should be something you look at as well. All right. Now it's time for the audience participation part of the talk. Um, we always like to do this uh, when we talk with various folks, and this is the biggest audience we get because people, not this many people show up to the policy working group meetings. So I'd love to ask a couple questions of the audience. How many of you in the audience, by showing your hand, uh, are using pod security admission in your workloads? I've got one, two, three, four, five people. It's like... 3% of the room, all right. How many people are using some sort of dynamic admission controller for their policy? A lot more people, sorry? Sure, why not? We still love Python, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and how many people are using validating admission policies even though they're not GA yet? <laughs> Got one, all right. And how many of you are planning to use validating admission policies once they hit GA? Okay, a few more, a few more, all right. Great, um, and then uh, we'd love to hear your questions, so if you have any questions, please raise your hand, and also we'd love to see, you know, as a policy working group, what you would like to hear from us next. What, you know, what can we do that's valuable for the community? And uh, you know, what guidance can we provide or what content can we put out or, you know, is the policy report API useful? We love all that feedback. We are going to be working on putting together a survey for the entire community. Uh, so keep an eye out for that and please tell us all of your policy wants and woes. Does anybody have any questions? I think there's a microphone coming to you. Ah, thank you. Hello. Oh, this worked immediately. Nice. Um, so uh, a question and a, a request. So a, a question of um, we obviously like using a bunch of policy stuff of the three that you just said. We don't use the alpha one, but we use the other two. Um, and we'll like apply things in the CI CD pipeline, but we also want to apply even earlier, like shift left. We want to get it down to being like our developers are writing Java code, they get compile time errors, they write the YAML, they get errors in their IDE that say this is going to break the policy before they even commit. Um, do you know if there's like further development within the policy tools for developing plugins for like VS Code or IntelliJ or any other of the IDEs that are properly used uh, for hooking that in to make sure the policies can work? There's one project that was attempting that and I don't recall the name, I'll have to look it up, but they were using a CLI, both from Caverno and Gator, which is the gatekeeper CLI, to do almost exactly that, uh, to provide validations. And those, you know, again, VS Code plugins, of course, uh, can be developed. So both, as long as you have a CLI, you should be able to do those type of validation checks and apply them as well. Cool. Yeah, but I'll, I'll look up the thing and maybe Try and post it at least in the you know policy working group Slack. Sweet. Uh, and then my thing for the future is like, we use Backstage and we uh, see a lot of other people using Backstage as well. And getting those policy reports and things into Backstage and visible for developers as well to see like, hey, maybe we're allowing things, but you have a bunch of stuff that's kind of a bit of a red flag that you should probably fix soon. And getting that reports easily available. So. Similarly to VS Code plugins is like backstage plugins and the, and the tooling for visibility um, would be amazing. Uh, as just a general request to the room, we will also be probably doing development work, but if anyone else is interested in that, that would be really appreciated. Yeah, I think that would be a great addition. And then if anybody wants to come work on backstage plugin as part of the policy working group, I'm sure we would be happy to talk about that. I think we had a question over here. 
Thank you both for the talk. Um, we've been using dynamic controllers now for probably three years, and we've racked up perhaps 100, 200 different policies mutating, validating, and generating. And uh, now with VAP, I've not thought about it much, but have you got a view as to whether we should start thinking about refactoring some of these, think about CEL? Um, how do you see that uh, tension between the two, in a sense, for someone who's already been doing this for a long time and has a body of policies already in, in production? Yeah, I think Jim probably has a great answer. So if you're not having any issues or problems with what you have, there's no you know, necessary reason to change, right? So, but at the same time, if there are these, any of these simpler checks which can be moved to the API server, think of it as offloading your dynamic admission controllers, executing these you know, further down into the system, so you're just embedding it at the API server level. So it really comes back to how expensive are your policies? Are you seeing issues in the workload which you want to offload? And if you don't have any complaints or any challenges with that, uh, it's fine to stay as is. No, no. All right, we're being told we are out of time. I think they're gonna kick us out. So, so we do have a session tomorrow. Uh, there is a, come like a meet and greet at 11 tomorrow. Uh, so again, please stop by if you have any other questions, if you want to know more about what we do in the policy working group or even join one of our future meetings. Hope to see everybody there and thank you. Thanks everybody.